week we began this journey together, and I came out here and I was giving lectures to strangers. We've been on the ship for a week now. I know most of you. I can call you by name here in the audience. So now we're just talking amongst friends. This is going to be fun. This is one of the special lectures for me because it's a real stroll down memory lane. It's an opportunity that I got to work or meet people who I grew up admiring when I was just a kid in Colorado wanting to go to Hollywood. And for those of you who are around my age, I say this is going to be a fun stroll down memory lane for you too. For those of you who are under 40, it's a history lesson. Take notes. I'm going to begin the thanks for the memories today with Mary Tyler Moore. We sadly lost her last year, and I put her very first because Mary Tyler Moore gave me my very first job in Hollywood. I was going to be doing this show, which was the Tony Randall Show, and it was being produced by MTM Studios, Mary Tyler Moore Studios. Remember the little kitty cat? Meow. Well, Mary had just finished the remarkable Mary Tyler Moore show. This was like in December of 1977. That series had ended and Mary was working on yet another new show. It was just going to be called Mary and she wanted to do her own musical variety hour. Well, the Carol Burnett show had just ceased and with the end of the Carol Burnett show, it was sort of the death knell for musical comedy shows. Ed Sullivan was off the air. Carol Burnett was no longer around. Mary tried this show. It only lasted a few episodes. Does anyone even remember Mary? She wanted to be a singer and dancer like crazy, and the audience just could have cared less. In fact, Mary was only 40 when she finished the Mary Tyler Moore show, 40-ish, I would say. And she tried several more times to have success in television, and it never really happened. We've we always think of Mary Tyler Moore as, oh, she was this great big success, and yes, she was, because we're still watching reruns of the Mary Tyler Moore show today and the Dick Van Dyke show, but she struggled to get anything else on television after this. She did go on to get an Academy Award nomination for Ordinary People, and she was just terrific in that, but even the movie roles didn't come, and it's that stigma that you have in Hollywood where you, how do you keep topping yourself? And will the audience accept you? The day that I met her, she was in an office. It was completely black. She was wearing dark clothes. She was smoking a cigarette. And it just seemed like when you think of Mary, you think of sunshine. And it was the darkest image I could imagine as the day that I actually met her. I was actually getting my first paycheck from her husband at the time, who was Grant Tinker and he was the head of MTM Studios. But I was working on the Tony Randall show. For those of you who were at my first lecture, you'll remember me saying that I was working on the Tony Randall show. I did half of a script, and CBS canceled the show. And there I was, out of work, 24 years old, nothing to do. Tony Randall, what a character he was for a wide-eyed kid who was just coming to Hollywood. He was just all over the set, he was crazy. Other people who were on that show was Swoozy Kurtz. Do you remember her? I just saw her in a movie just a couple weeks ago. She's now playing Grandma in Overboard, the new remake of the Goldie Hawn picture that is now has Anna Faris in it. She's in that. Alan Land McCleary was also in this show. This was a fine entrance into Hollywood, let me tell you. Well, you can't do a show called Thanks for the Memories without talking about Bob Hope, of course. This is his theme song. And I had the opportunity to meet Bob Hope on several different occasions. The time that I'm going to talk about right now was that I was invited to Bob Hope's 90th birthday party. And NBC would always do specials with Bob Hope, and they were going to be televising this big event for his 90th birthday party. So it was being taped at NBC Studios in Burbank, California. And I found myself seated right up front at a big table, in right in front of the stage, and there were six of us seated at this table. And I looked around, and it was, I, I was amazed. I was sitting next to Dorothy L'Amour. I was sitting there with George Burns, oh, God himself. What a great evening this was. Well, as I said, Dorothy L'Amour was there, and at one point, 
after dinner, she came up on stage, and she was doing some banter with him, which they were going to be recording for television. Well, Bob is 90 years old at this point. He has a hearing aid in his ear. He doesn't hear very well. And they were flubbing their lines like crazy, doing take after take. Well, Dorothy Lamore came down, and she sat down afterwards, and she was miffed, and she said, Damn him. When we were making movies together, he jumped all over my lines, and he's doing it again today. <laughs> oh, it all came out well in the edit, let me tell you. So as I was saying, I was sitting there with George Burns, too, and I struck up a conversation with him, and he gave me some really, really terrific advice. So I'll share that advice with you, but you have to stay to the end of the lecture. I'm going to come back to it, okay? Also there that evening was Ginger Rogers. I was there with an actress friend of mine, Georgette, and she, in particular, was a very big Ginger Rogers fan, so she dragged me over and she said, I, I've just got to talk to Ginger Rogers. Ginger was in her 90s at this point. This was shortly before she passed. She was confined to a wheelchair. She had become quite large. And Georgette went up to her and told her how much she loved all of the singing and dancing that she had done over the years. And Ginger sat there, and she literally tears welled up in her eyes, and she grabbed Georgette's hand, and she said, thank you so much. And I guess I came to appreciate then that everybody really likes to hear from the public and get that kind of reaction. And she was just up there doing her job the best she could, and she didn't, you just don't realize how you, you touch people and reach people, and it was a very heartfelt moment. I'll never forget it. Two other guys who were there that night were Phil Hartman and Michael Richards. Phil Hartman, you might remember, from Saturday Night Live. Unfortunately, we lost him much too soon, too, when his wife shot him about 20 years ago. And Michael Richards... Kramer from Seinfeld, remember him? Well, Michael Richards and I went to school together. We both went to San Diego State University together. These two were having a fun time at this, at this 90th birthday party for him. They were dressed up as Civil War veterans. And they were reminiscing about, remember Bob Hope always entertained the troops every Christmas time? They were reminiscing about when he came to the Civil War and entertained them. One was from the north, one was from the south, and they got into arguments about what Bob was doing for them. It was a lot of fun. Well, as I said, I went to school with Michael Richards, so I'm going to put a little segment in the show right now where I talk about the friends who I went to school with at San Diego State University. It's kind of fun to look back at your mates in college and everything, and you sort of wonder at the time, who's going to be successful, who isn't going to be successful? It was a level playing field for all of us at this point. But here are some of the people who I went to school with who actually went on to be quite famous. Julie Kavner. She played Brenda on Rhoda. Anyone remember Rhoda and Brenda from the Mary Tyler Moore Show? This was the spinoff of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And Brenda, or Julie Kavner, graduated two years ahead of me. I was just a sophomore when she graduated from San Diego State. But she went up to Hollywood, and she was doing, she got an agent, she was doing the audition thing, but mostly she was a temp secretary. And she got a chance to audition for the pilot of Rhoda, which she auditioned for, but she did not get the part. They taped the pilot of Rhoda, and CBS said, yes, we're going to put it on the air, but we really don't like the actress who we put in there as Rhoda's sister. But, hmm, they called... Julie back and gave her a second audition, and she landed the role. Well, I can tell you, back at San Diego State, there were hoops and hollers like crazy. We thought, yay for Julie. If she can do it, there's a chance for all of us. Another one, oh, you may remember her now. She, um, she's the voice of Marge Simpson. She's been the voice of Marge Simpson for 25 years now, and I think it's made her a gazillionaire. She's doing very well. She was also in a lot of the, she performed with Tracy Ullman in all of Tracy Ullman's various TV shows that she had. And she did quite a few Woody Allen pictures as well. 
but it's probably Marge Simpson that she's going to go down in the history books for. This is David Leisure, and we went to San Diego State, too. That's him on the left-hand side, up top. He was part of Empty Nest, which was a spinoff from the Golden Girls. Anyone remember Golden Girls and Empty Nest? Ran for quite a few seasons was ri with Richard Mulligan. I can remember once I was living in North Hollywood and some old classmates gave me a phone call and they said, David Leisure's living out of his car. Can you come up with 20 bucks? We're trying to pay his rent this month. So, of course, I chipped in. David, I'd like my $20 back, please. I think he's done okay for himself. He started getting breaks right after that. He was in the, he was the Hare Krishna in the airplane movies. Remember the airplane spoofs? He was the Hare Krishna in that. And then he did for years, he was Joey Suzu, the lying guy on Joey Suzu commercials. He's done okay. Ann Archer, beautiful actress, also someone who I gr went to San Diego State with. She graduated several years ahead of me too. Star of Fatal Attraction with Michael Douglas. I don't know about you, but anytime I see a bunny boiled in a pot of water, I think of Ann Archer, don't you? Ooh, how creepy was that movie? And she played the first lady on Air Force One with Harrison Ford. But out of all of us at San Diego State, Ann was the one who we thought was going to become successful because she had that inside track that the rest of us didn't have. She had a famous parent. Do any of you know who Ann Archer's fam famous parent is, was? Marjorie Lord from Make Room for Daddy. And remember the Danny Thomas show, Make Room for Daddy? That was her mother. So, of course, she had all the ins with a big in like that, right? Well, back during my struggle years when I was knocking on doors around Hollywood, I had written a play and was getting quite a bit of attention. I had written a play about this guy right here, George S. Kaufman, who was a big playwright, the great collaborator in New York. The, here he is with Moss Hart. Together they wrote, You Can't Take It With You, The Man Who Came to Dinner. Lots of wonderful shows. He was very big back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Well, he was an old curmudgeon of a guy, and I was writing this play about him, and it was getting a lot of attention. And my agent called me one day, and she said, David Chasman, who's the president of MGM Studios, has read your play, and he'd like to discuss it with you. Do you have time for lunch? I said, uh, yeah, I think so. So I went to have lunch at the MGM Studios. Oh my, it was such a pleasure to go through the regular commissary and head on over to the executive lounge with the, with the president. We were sitting there and we were discussing my play and he w looked over my shoulder at one point and he saw somebody and he motioned him like this. And he said, oh, I hope you don't mind. I, I asked someone to join us for lunch. Guess who he asked? Cary Grant. Did I mind having lunch with Cary Grant? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so there I was. I was absolutely starstruck, mesmerized. I don't remember saying another thing for the rest of the afternoon, let me tell you. But Cary Grant was there, and I just remember the conviviality. The, he took himself so lightly. He, was, he brushed things off his shoulder, and he just laughed about everything. At a certain point, I looked, and he was going like this and motioning somebody else over to the table. And this is who came and joined us. Art Linkletter. And Art Linkletter and Cary Grant were best friends. Who'd have thunk? I would have thought that they inhabited two different universes, one being a big movie star, one being a daytime television guy. But they were both MGM board members, and they had known each other for years, and oh my goodness, the banter that went back and forth between these two, it was just such a fun afternoon. I also remember taking mental notes, looking at Cary Grant, who was dressed to the nines, and I thought, David, this is what success looks like. I never quite achieved it, but I know what it looks like. Later that afternoon, I was back at my apartment in North Hollywood. I was downstairs. I was shoving quarters into, a, into the laundromat, doing my laundry. 
And I, I literally pinched myself at one point and I said, you had lunch with Cary Grant today. Can you believe it? <laughs> one of my favorite fond memories. So as it turns out, David Chasman really didn't help me that much with my production getting this play produced, but this gentleman did. Uncle Milty, and he truly became like an uncle to me. He took an interest in it. He had known George S. Kaufman, and he sort of took me under his wings, and he helped open doors for me around Hollywood, introduced me to people. It was just a terrific guy. He introduced me to Natalie Schaefer. Remember her from Gilligan's Island? M yes. Lovey, lovey Mrs. Thurston Powell. Powell. Thank you. And... She had had an affair with George S. Kaufman. George and his wife had a special arrangement. They had an open marriage way back when. And she sort of fell in love with him. And she told me the story where she called him one night. And she said, oh, oh, George, I have such a headache, such a headache. I need you over here. Won't you please come over? And he said, okay. So the great old curmudgeon about an hour later, there's a knock on her door. She opened the door, and there was George. He handed her an aspirin and walked away. <laughs> that is so George S. Kaufman, let me tell you. But she came to, we ended up doing the play. It didn't make it all the way to Broadway, but we had several productions of it in the Los Angeles area, and Natalie Schaefer was at every performance, I can tell you. Great, great support. There she is, lovey. Well, again, as I was going through, as I was starting to work in Hollywood now, those of us who are writers and producers, well, everybody in Hollywood, we end up at Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills. Any of you been to Nate and Al's in Beverly Hills? It was sort of the big hangout for, for everyone. And I can remember going there one morning, and as I sat at my table, I looked at the four tables around me, and I thought, my goodness, this is the most eclectic group only in Hollywood could you have a crowd like this in the same restaurant. So over here on my right-hand side was this gentleman, Vidal Sassoon. Anyone remember him? Many of you might still be using your, his shampoo in your hair right now. He was over on the right. Behind me then was this guy, Henny Youngman. Remember him? He went all the way back to vaudeville. Take my wife, please. He had been a big regular on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Always had been a big fan, always there with his fiddle. Over on this side then was James Kahn, who was just about as hot as anyone could be in Hollywood at the time. He had just come up from the Godfather movies. He was red hot. This was just before he did um, the one where his foot was axed by Annie Wilk, but um, we don't need to go there. And then a young man came in, and he sat at the table right in front of me. And about three months later, he had an album that came out that kind of sort of went through the roof. Michael Jackson. This was just before Thriller came out, back in like 1983 or so. So I thought, can you imagine? That, that's quite a crowd around you. Look in the dining room tonight and see if you've got a crowd like this around you in the dining room. Fun times. Another, another story just popped in my head. I was at Nate and Al's one morning, and this was about 1981, I would say, and the Oscars were going, the Oscar nominations were going to be announced that morning. So everybody came to hear the Oscar nominations because it was quite early in L.A. because they did it for the East Coast. So I'm standing there, and I'm standing like this because we're so crowded, and who's right here next to me is Neil Diamond. Well, he had just made his very first movie that year, which was a remake of The Jazz Singer. And he had written many of the songs for the soundtrack album, and he had done one song that was just terrific. It gives me goosebumps to this day. America, we're coming to America. Remember that song? Great, great song. So as I'm standing there beside him, I took the opportunity to say, Mr. Diamond, I want to be the first to congratulate you on your nomination for Best Song of the Year. And he said, thank you. I'm hoping to. Well, the nominations came out that morning, 
and he was not nominated. They did not nominate that song. This is back in the day when the music part of the Academy seemed to be getting it wrong every year. A few years after that, just before this, they hadn't nominated anything from Saturday Night Fever, which was a huge, huge impact on movies and everything. They didn't nominate any of those songs either. I think the Academy got it wrong then. I still think they got it wrong today. But I'm still a big Neil Diamond fan. So what are some of the lessons learned from some of the people who I was introduced to? This is a fun thing that I like to share with you now. One is Carol Channing. Carol Channing I got to work with several times when I was at Disney. Her agent called me one day and said, Carol would love to be a voice for one of your cartoon characters if you'd ever do something for her. Well, it just has so happened that I was writing a script right then in animation, and it was about a famous dog, a dog who was the star of many an Alpo commercial. So I said, yeah, bring Carol in. So she came in. This was the character that we created, Canina Lafer. This is hanging up in my bathroom right now, so I took a picture in my bathroom before I uh, came here. And it said, but you made me so pretty, grateful, <laughs> Carol Channing. I'll tell you another story in a couple days about recording this. It was so much fun. But people come up to me all of the time, and they ask me for advice. Gee, I've got, my daughter wants to be in the movies. Do you have any advice for her? Or my niece wants to be in the movies. What can you recommend? And one of the things that I learned from Carol Channing we went to lunch several times, and she told me that Carol Channing was actually a character that she created. She said, I took a little bit of Marilyn Monroe, I took a little bit of Ethel Barrymore, a little bit from this person, a little bit from that person, and she combined it so that she became Carol Channing. And that's who she was when she presented it to the public. She knew how to market herself. She knew how to separate herself from other actresses so that she was a bigger-than-life personality. And I think that that's a very smart thing for anyone who wants to go into movies to remember. How do you separate yourself from everybody else who is out there? It's all about marketing. So take that advice and give it to your niece or your daughters or keep it for yourself if you think you want to be the um, older person who's doing, where's the beef? Where's the beef? Phyllis Diller. Ah, any Phyllis Diller fans here? Loved Phyllis, loved her to death. And the thing that I learned from Phyllis Diller is to always stay in touch. That's why it's so much easier these days. When you get to know me, chances are we'll be s exchanging emails and such. Back in the day with Phyllis, it was postcards. And just out of the blue, you never knew when, but you would get a, a postcard. One was from Hawaii, beautiful picture on the front, turned it over and it said, having a wonderful time here in Hawaii, so glad you're not here, Phyllis. Another one I got another day, and these are all in my scrapbook now, it was, it's a beautiful day, think I'll get a nose job. Phyllis. Well, Phyllis was so good about keeping in touch. Now, I went to her home several times, and you would think that someone who looked like this and th all the stories about her and Fang, you would have thought that th her house probably was a monstrosity like this. No, 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 no. One of the most beautiful homes in Brentwood that I've ever been to, and she had a big classical baby grand piano right in the living room there, and she was a classical pianist. I don't know how many of you know that, but she could play the piano like nobody. Great, great lady. Really miss her. Another one is Debbie Reynolds. This was during my struggle years when I was living in North Hollywood. I was still trying to furnish my apartment, and right across the street on Lancashire, there was a furniture store, Wurtz Brothers Furniture. So I went over there one day to buy a couple of chairs that I needed, only to find that Wurtz Brothers was completely boarded up. It said sold. Nobody was around. Well, I'm walking around, I'm looking in the windows, and who do I see in there? The only person in there is Debbie Reynolds. She was in there, and she bought the Wurtz Brothers place, and she let me in, and she sort of showed me around. She said that there's no place in Hollywood where anyone can rehearse. So she was going to turn that big warehouse into a rehearsal studio 
Do any of you watch Dancing with the Stars now? And you always see the segments where they, you see the dancers rehearsing with the stars and such. Chances are that's probably being taped at the Debbie Reynolds Rehearsal Studio. It's still there to this day. It's been there 40 years now. Great, great place. Debbie told me she was just, she was there, she was wearing a caftan and she had this big turban on her hair. She looked a wreck. And she said that she had purchased many of the costumes from the old MGM studios during their auction. And she wanted to have a place to show off those old costumes as well. It never quite happened here in this rehearsal studio. She did have a few things there, but she ended up buying a hotel in Las Vegas later and she tried doing it there. That was one of her big dreams that never really materialized was getting all of those costumes shown like she wanted. But she heard me that day and she said, well, I've still got a couple chairs if you want to buy these from me. So I bought two chairs from Debbie Reynolds and I had them for like 40 years. I called them my Debbie Reynolds chairs. They were always in the guest bedroom. If you came to my house, chances are you sat on the Debbie Reynolds chairs. We just moved from La Jolla, California to Fort Lauderdale last year and we're downsizing. We sold our home. We're just in a condo now. We sold all of our furniture, every single stitch of furniture that we had to buy new for our condo. Well, I sold the Debbie Reynolds chairs two weeks before she and Carrie passed. I could kind of kick myself now. I went through all of my old pictures. This is the only picture I could come up with of my Debbie Reynolds chairs. You see one there in the corner. There's another one on this side. You can kind of see the legs here. But those are my Debbie Reynolds chairs. So I hope whoever has them now is taking good care of them. Well, back in 1988, 30 years ago now, I, it was a good year for me. I won the Emmy that year for Jim Henson's Muppet Babies. I was also nominated for the Humanitas Award. And because of all these accolades I was getting, I got an invitation to have breakfast with the president. 41, George H.W. Bush. I was there that morning at back at the White House with Tony Danza, remember? He was a Who's the Boss, also from Taxi. There were five of us, my writing partner Ken, he was there, two other writer producers, and Tony Danza. And we sat down at the, at the table with the president, and he, <laughs> he sat there and he said, I just want one thing. What's the gossip? And so we sat there for an hour with the president, and we gossiped. We told him everything that was going on in Hollywood. Tony Danza was trying to get me to be on his show at the time. I had already signed another contract with Universal Studios at the time. But we just sat there and gossiped. Finally, at the end of the breakfast, the president got up. He sort of straightened his tie, and he said, Well, I thank you. I can't wait to tell Barbara. <laughs> So this is the two of them. We lost her earlier this year, but I'm hoping that Barbara had a, a nice evening with the president that, that night and they gossiped together. Fun, fun memories. Also that year, I got an invitation to meet the Pope, Pope John Paul II. And he came to Los Angeles. I got an invitation. And yes, he gave a speech. It was, it was kind of boring, if you want to know the truth. But it was who I was there with and who I was sitting with at the table that made it such a fascinating day for me. I was there with Bob Hope again, second time to meet him. And Oliver Stone, this was during the time, just he had just finished the movie JFK. And big director, won the Oscar for Platoon. Fascinating guy to sit there and talk to, as were this guy couple, Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue, charming couple. It was just a great day and to commiserate with, with these people. Once the Pope left and, and got all the attention off of him, then we had ourselves a real fun time. Great memories. This is Olga King. We lived in England for five years, from 2002 to 2008, six years almost, and Olga was my next door neighbor, a lovely old lady. She just passed a couple years ago. She made it to 97, good for her. But Olga was, she was getting up there in the years and she, she couldn't 
turn on a light switch without my help, I promise you. <laughs> so I did everything for Olga, but it was all, everything I enjoyed to do. She was such a treat, so much fun. And whenever her brother came to town, she always made sure that we had lunch. She always wanted me to have lunch with her famous brother. Any idea who her brother might be? Engelbert Humperdinck. Remember Engelbert? There was a 16-year difference between the two of them. He's really Jerry Dorsey, and he lives in Leicester, England now. He's still out there performing. I drive through Vegas every now and then and see that he's still headlining. He's in his 80s now, but he's hanging in there, and good old times with Engelbert. I also got to meet Margaret Thatcher once upon a time, and... My writing partner, Ken Koontz, was very much enamored of, he was a big Margaret Thatcher supporter, really admired her. And we had a secretary when we worked at Universal Studios, and if you wanted something done, you just asked Jackie. Jackie could get everything done. So Ken went up to her and he said, I want to meet Margaret Thatcher when she comes to the studio. And Jackie arranged it. So the tour bus came out, and there was Ken ready to meet Margaret Thatcher. I met her. Mostly, they were c talking and commiserating, and I was back with her husband, David, I believe his name was. But he finally just yelled, can we get this tour going again, please? And separated the two of them. I particularly thought about Margaret Thatcher when I saw the movie Iron Lady with Meryl Streep. Did you see that? I thought she just did a knockout job of portraying Margaret Thatcher in that movie. Great movie, great lady, great Meryl Streep. When I was working at the Walt Disney Studios, I was in located in, in the Burbank, Hollywood area, working at Disney at the time, but I had to go to Florida for one reason or another. This was back in the early 90s, and Disney asked me, well, while you're down there, would you mind doing, I was the voice recorder for all of the uh, animated shows that we were doing up in the Burbank area. So they said, would you pick up a couple of commercials and things that we need recorded while you're down in Florida? So I said, okay. So if you've been down to the theme park then, you know that Disney now has the rights to Star Wars, and as you go through the Star Wars line, you've got to go through all that rigmarole, and they try to keep you entertained while you're doing that. Well, there's a little robot there who's talking to you as you're standing and weaving through the lines. So we recorded that that day. We sped up the voice so that you wouldn't quite recognize it, but do you know who that voice is? Pee-wee. Paul Rubens. And Paul and I were friends for years. I had the show on CBS before Pee-wee's Playhouse, and I had the show on after his. So whenever we had to go to affiliates meetings for CBS, we were always thrown together and um, went to all those functions. Great, great times. A lot of fun with Pee Wee Herman. Too much fun. Also, I went and then there was the new Mickey Mouse Club. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up on the old Mickey Mouse Club with the Net Funicello and Bobby Brown, the whole gang. This was the new Mickey Mouse Club in the 90s, and I realize now as I did the commercial for that particular show that I was working with many of today's top stars, stars like Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears. Mostly I remember Britney Spears' mother. Thank you very much. <laughs> Justin Timberlake and Ryan Gosling. This is what the two of them looked like back then. I'd say these guys are doing okay. Last year at the Oscars, Ryan was up for best, best Actor for La La Land, and Justin was up for Best Song for Can't Stop the Feeling. So I think these two are doing okay for themselves. Well, one day when I was working on Harry and the Hendersons, I did this show for Steven Spielberg, and... We were, I came to work one Monday morning, and we learned that the actor who played Harry in the Bigfoot suit, he had passed away that weekend. Totally unexpected. We had no idea that he was even sick. Whoops. This is him, Kevin Peter Hall. And one, how were we going to replace him? But two, 
How are we going to replace someone who is seven foot four? Those are truly big feet to fill for that particular costume. Well, we were, we were having quite a Monday, real rough time. And Rick Baker, who you may know, he's won a, a, a billion different Oscars, too. He's up there with Meryl Streep when it comes to Oscars. He always wins best makeup, and he's the guy who created the Bigfoot suit. Well, we were commiserating as to what we were going to do, and he sort of patted his top pocket like this, and he said, follow me. So we walked out of the soundstage that we were working on, and we walked up the hill back, uh, the back lot of Universal Studios there, and we went up to this place, the Bates Hotel. Remember this from Psycho? Can't you see Norman Bates running out in his mother's outfit there? Well, we sat up on the porch there, and we kind of smoked a doobie for the afternoon then and made ourselves feel a little bit better. But now as we're sitting there crying in our beer, all of the tour buses were coming up along from the Universal Studios, and there we are just waving to all the people from Norman Bates's house. Oh, I can only imagine what they thought. Fun times, fun times. Okay, so we're back to George. So while I was at Bob Hope's 90th birthday party, we were sitting there, and I thought, you've got George Burns here. He was 97 at this point in his life. And I said, Mr. Burns, if you wouldn't mind sharing with me, what do you think has been the success to your, what are, what are the keys to your success and longevity? And God bless him, he really took me seriously. He sat there, he was puffing his cigar. He puffed, he puffed, he looked at me. And at one point he said, keep breathing. <laughs> so that's my advice to you. I want to thank you so much for coming to this lecture today. I've got another one coming up tomorrow. And between now and then, please, keep breathing, okay? Take care.